Good afternoon. This is Wednesday, the 6th of October, 2004, and we are at the Atlanta Historical Society, the Atlanta History Center. I'm Newell Bryant Tozer, and this Henry Howell is with me, who's on the board at the History Center, and we're going to interview John J. Broom, who was a veteran of World War II and talk about his experiences in World War II. We want to hear all about that because you had you were part of history and we want this interview to be a part of history. So thank you for coming. Uh, Mr. Broom, you were born in the 30th of May, 25, 1925, in Troop County, Georgia. That's correct. Which is down there outside LaGrange, you say. Correct. I know LaGrange well. And, uh, so that's where you were born. And then when you were 18 years old, in 1943, you told me you enlisted. Yes. In the Navy? In the Navy. In the U.S. Navy. And where did you go first? To a place right out of Baltimore they call Bangbridge, Maryland. That's where I was inducted into the Navy. Bangbridge, Maryland, right outside of Baltimore. All right. And at, after Bangbridge, what happened? They sent me to San Francisco and put me aboard ship there in San Francisco. And I left there and went to Hawaii. And I was aboard ship most of the time from being on USS Independence. The US? Where'd you pick up the independence? In San Francisco? In San Francisco. And she was new ship at that point? Yes. So you, you came aboard as a plank owner, as they call it now. Right. That's right. Nice. And so that was in, in 43. Yes. That you got, you were on the independence from 43. Yes. On. And, uh, it was a big aircraft carrier. It was medium size. It was not like the Lexington. Uh, the Independence was a medium size carrier, what we call medium at that time. Mm -hmm. It was not the big aircraft carrier. We mostly transported like whatever the big carriers needed. Mm -hmm. They sent it out aboard the Independence. And it would go from the Independence to the big carriers like the Lexington. And that was big carrier at that time. Mm -hmm. The biggest carrier at that time, I think. Right. That was the biggest of all the carriers. Right. The Lexington. And uh, what did you do uh, on the independence? I was my name aboard ship was was uh, to uh, was captain's boy. The captain. But you told me that your highest rank that you became was steward. Right. Steward went first from, class. Went from third class to first class, and I was first class steward. And whatever the captain wanted or needed, I got word to the guard who was standing at the door, which was the Marine. Did you tell me it was a, like working for a family? Yes. Uh, yes. So 
Just like looking for a camp family if Captain Warner or Glass of War, I saw that he got it. If he wanted the order from the ring at the door to get something or do something, I saw that the Marine got the wood and the Marine carried it from there. You know, I didn't realize that the Marines was, Navy. was part of the Navy that way. I just didn't mm -hmm. realize that, that they would be in that capacity. Yes. That's interesting. They essentially did all the security work on the ship. They were, they were the police on the ship as well as man some of the anti-aircraft guns. Right. I see. I see. Was there one captain the whole time? Because... One captain at a time. I served three captains, one at a time. Right. So, it's like one captain would be on from six months or maybe longer for one at a time. And if we could go back, mm -hmm. I don't think you probably came aboard as captain's boy. Oh, uh, did you? No, I did not. Uh, That's a very special position. How did you get there? How did you become was, captain's boy? Well, captain's boy, it's kind of like working for your mother. Tough what, job. <laughs> whatever the captain wanted or needed, I saw that he got it or the Marine got the word that he needed. But how was he smart enough to pick you out of all the stewards around that he had it his beck and call. I was really doing that type of work when I went into the Navy. Said that uh, I was working for the Dodger family when I went into the Navy. And I guess that kind of gave me a hand up because that was the field that I was in before I went in the Navy. So because you had worked for a family, somehow that made the captain choose you. Which you would, the captain was smart to choose you because it worked out well. Well, I, I did that type of work. Uh, I was working at a private home mm -hmm. before I went in the Navy. And when I went in, to me, it was like doing the same thing that I had been trained to do. I knew how to serve the table, set the table, and captain aboard ship, go to full, full strike captain with a full commander was next in command, and like the captain wanted to have guests, I already knew how to set the table, how to serve the captain, because I had did that before. And so I guess that kind of gave me a hand up on the others, which I don't know why some of the rest of them had had that experience or not, but I think that's what I was saying. Sounds like it. Now, you were in the service in the Navy from 1943 to 1946, right. so you were 21 when you got out. Right. Um, and I was just amazed.
tell me about this. You said that you went two years without seeing land. Well, I was stationed aboard ship. The Independence. The Independence. And there were three captains aboard that ship during the time that I was in the Navy, during the time that I served on the Independence. And I can't say for sure that's why I was chosen, but to me, it was just like working for Mr. Howell's mother. I kind of knew the way she wanted things done because I had did that before. Of course. And that's where it was a good ship. Well, tell us some of the experiences because Henry Howell said something about a explosion or tell me about that because I don't know about that. Well, it, I think, it, did you take a, a hit from an aircraft, Japanese aircraft? Oh yes, yes. What, right. I know nothing about that except that the Independence was very badly damaged right. in 1943, fairly early on. I was stationed aboard ship at that time and my bows station was on the hangar deck, that's the deck below the flight deck, and it was just an everyday thing, just like I get up and go to your house to go to work, that's the way it was aboard the independence, and by me being captain for captain might tell me I'm going to the bridge to bring me up a cup of coffee. Well, I would either take it or see to it that he got it. And that's the way, I guess, I guess that's the reason I was chosen because it was just kind of an everyday thing. So what were some of your experiences aboard the Independence? Well, uh, the captain was a full, full strike captain. And any time that the Independence was attacked or the Third Fleet was attacked, the captain would go to the bridge. And if he wanted a cup of coffee, I would either get it to him or see to it that he got it. If he told me, tell the orderly, the Marine, to stand by, well, the captain might take the wheel, but that Marine had to stand by and take orders and do whatever. Hmm. And yeah. did the independence come under attack? <laughs> Many times. Many times it was under attack. Many times. Tell us about those attacks. Well, you might be sailing along the fleet I was in. It was called a Thury Fleet. And another ship might get hit might be a torpedo, might be a bomb, or what have you, but if the captain told me to stand by for further orders, I just had to wait there until the captain said, do this, bring me a cup of coffee, or tell the Marine to come to the bridge, or or what have you, so a lot of time this ship would be attacked, not being necessary, but it might get hit. Uh, I just had to do whatever. Hmm. How badly was 
because it hit sometimes. <laughs> it was hit pretty bad the worst I thought they say I don't have no way of knowing this was maybe 500 people got killed at one time. Aboard the Independence? Yes. Were you there then? Yes, ma'am. How close a call was it for you? I don't know. I can say it, it, it happened this way. I was, my valve station was the ward room, and if the ship got hit, Whatever next they wanted me to do, they would t tell you to tell the Marine to stand by, you come by. So it's hard to tell how close they came to you. What happened when that, that the really big hit that the Independence took, when maybe a uh, that would be about a quarter of the crew was right, killed. Right, right. What what happened that after that? How how did they handle such a big casualty? My station was the ward room, and I just had to stand there until the captain say, "Get the marine." tell the Marine to do this, or you do that, but no matter what happened during that time, when the ship got hit, like, this is the ward room, this is the flight deck, I'm in the ward room, when the ship got hit, well, I, when I landed, I landed back down, so I just had to stay there until they say, do something else, and I don't remember what they told me to do with my next up there was. But, but you went flying a little bit when the ship got hit? Oh, yes, uh, the whole ship went flying. Yeah, it was a big hit, I think. The whole ship went flying. Did you lose any friends? Oh, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. You lost friends in that? Yeah. But, I mean, being the rate and rank that I had, I could not tell you if it hadn't did this, this would have happened or that would have happened because all I know when I landed back down, I just had to wait till the next order. Really, I don't remember what the next order was. Were you frightened? Not really, because it was just something happened every day. It just happened different at that time. Hmm. And the ship, did it come back? Where did it go to get repaired after that big hit? Well, we came to... Uh, Back to Pearl Harbor or? Back to Pearl Harbor. Back to Pearl Harbor. Uh, the tin can ran CAP around us all the way back to Pearl Harbor and we were tied up with the other ship. And whatever your order was told you to do. That's what you did at that time, but you never knew what was going to happen next. You just, hmm. So you were sort of limping back. Right. Uh, and we went on back. So you saw land then, and you could get off at Pearl Harbor, of course, couldn't you? After a while, after about six months. Well, while the ship was being repaired? Yes. Really? 
You had to stay on the ship. Not off the ship, but on the ship. And watch what you say. Watch what you say. All right. Always have to watch what you say. Were they particular about why they were saying, watch what you say? Yes. Uh, didn't have all this sophisticated stuff like you got now. And uh, if you said something that the captain of uh, your commanding officer didn't like what you said, You would have to go to the what they call the bridge and be questioned why you said it. Hmm. Um, yeah, yeah. Do you remember the names of the captains? The three Captain Ewan, Captain Johnson, Captain Kendale. Those were my three captains. Three captains. And did they change captains while the ship was in Pearl Harbor? Yes, sir. And I guess he'd been through enough. They figured, try a new one. They, I figured that they didn't like his chain of command, but, you know, just being an enlisted person there, not knowing. Did you have a, a favorite among the three? I don't think so, no. I don't remember one being a favorite over the other. I know Captain Thompson seemed to, well, what I call a better captain. That was back then. That's a hard position you were in. I imagine there were times you got pretty angry and you couldn't say anything. Couldn't say anything. not for me. Where did you sleep, John? Where was your berth? Back then, the Navy was segregated and we had what they call war which means that white and black was not in the same war, but if the captain told me to go to the war room and stay there until further orders, that's what I had to do. And a war has so many people in it. My war sometimes might be told to stay on the first day or second day according to the position that the ship was in. Mm -hmm. So I just slept wherever my war was assigned. I see. About how many people were in a war? I would say from 20. In one war. How many black folks would have been aboard? They had a war of black people who were segregated at that time, and if my war had 30 people in it, which would have been all black. I would stay with that ward until I had orders to stay someplace else. And would there, there have been more than 30 black men aboard, I would bet? Sometimes, yes, sometimes. Sometimes not. So, 
that had to be tough in its own way, having yeah. it being a very small minority of the whole crew. Right. And, yeah. About how large was the whole crew? Everyone. I would say about 2,200, but it might have been more at one time than at another time. And you just had to... That's a large... That, see, that would be the air group as well as the ship's company. Okay. And John, the captain, they all ran the ship. Mm -hmm. But almost as many people were connected with the airplanes and the maintenance of the airplanes. That's right. I they see. had a different command structure. Oh, But they I were see. all in the same, <laughs> they were all in the same boat. Oh. Right. <laughs> but uh, they, they're two separate parts of that boat. I see. So, you're dealing with people who are used to having stuff done the minute they say, get it done, and have it done right. You think they abused that position at all, or were they fairly considerate in what they asked? I think they were fairly considerate of what they asked because if you were my commanding officer and you told me to do something and I did it wrong, I had to explain why I did it wrong. Did you tell me to do it wrong or did I do it wrong because I didn't know no better or what was my reason? doing it wrong, and then I would be questioned by other officers of the group as to why I did it the way I did it. Knowing you, I bet that didn't happen very often. Not much. I tried to do it right the first time. But, like I said, by me being captain for I had a little more leeway, a little more outlet than a lot of them did. And that's the story of war. You got used to it. And did being captain's boy do, how did that put you with the rest of, of your friends on board? Were they jealous of you? Yes, in a way, but they couldn't say anything or show it because I had to do what I was told to do or what I was supposed to know how to do. Uh, a full captain is different from the name captain. If you were a full captain, you were a full Full stripe gold player. And the name captain could be an insulin, a half stripe. So you didn't mind keeping your mouth shut. Well, that was going to be my next question, John. One of the questions I wanted to ask you is Did you hear a lot of confidential information? Yes. Yes. Things you had to keep secret? Right. 
Tell us about that. Well, that's Captain of four, four straight gold breed. It's sitting down here talking to a, a bunch of commanders and other captains, and I'm standing there serving them. What I hear, I can't repeat it. So you'd learn things that a lot of people would have liked to know, right. and you just had to keep your mouth shut. Right. And you knew to keep your mouth shut. Better keep your mouth shut. <laughs> That's wise. I think we know why John stayed captain's boy. Yes. Many reasons, but discretion is high among them. Absolutely. So you served the captain and whoever he was eating with, their meals? Whoever his guests were. Mm -hmm. If he told me to tell the Marine to get in touch with him 30 minutes later or do something else 30 minutes later. I was to give his order to the Marine who would be standing there. And if it were not done, I got to say I gave him your command. What did you think of the Marines? The Marine Navy was the same to me because by me being captain for the Marines stood here at the door to take orders from the captain and I had to see that he got that order or see why he didn't get it. John, well, excuse me, were you uh, injured uh, during some of these hits aboard the Independence? Were you ever injured? Well, I was hurt, I would say. When I say hurt instead of injured, it means that I might have fallen the wrong way. Maybe got a bruise or something, but what they call injury to the point where I had to be hospitalized or discharged or something, I never was hurt to that. So you were fortunate? Yes, very, very. But some of your friends were killed. Right. What about? Did you receive any medals or awards for your work? I only got medals for the bells of, uh, I guess you call it, time that the ship were in. And bow during the time that I was a boy. Mm -hmm. But those would have been a lot of, a lot of ribbons, or a lot of battles. Well, I I can't prove this, but as near as I can remember, it was around hundred and two times. That's that's a lot of days under attack. Yes. So you had special ribbons? Yes. Do you keep those? I don't know where they are now. They were given to me. But I don't know what happened. 
meant very little to other people who did not know what they stood yeah. for. It would be interesting to see him now. <laughs> I would know what the hell was true was going down. Did you, after the war, did you keep up with any of the friends that you had on the ship? I did not. We might uh, call or run into each other mm -hmm. every once in a while. But were they any from Georgia or were they from all over the country? All over the country. All over the United States? Yes. Well, what was it like? I mean, you were 18 at the time? Yes. Went in. Not, not exactly a country boy, but on the other hand, not a big city guy either. Right. And suddenly you're thrown in with people from all over the country, black and white. That, and you're at sea, which I don't think you've ever been before. No. Probably never seen the ocean before. Mm -hmm. Most of them never had. What, what was, what was, had to be a pretty amazing experience. It was, in a way, but by you not being able to say anything or to tell them about it. Oh, you just see them just, just day to day. You mean you were so young that you just took it as a part of life? Right. That you were going through this one day at a time. Were you very homesick? I mean, being as young as I was, home didn't, didn't bother me. But like I, I don't say I wanted to be there, but I didn't want to be back home. I it was just a place that I happened to be. It may be better than home. Right? So you were doing your patriotic duty. Right. And you knew that. That's why people enlisted. That's why everybody enlisted. And I'm sure that's why you enlisted, wasn't it? To take care of your country and do your patriotic. I, I didn't want to do what I knew I was going to have to do if I stayed home. Mm -hmm. And what was that? Go to the field and go to work. This was a sort of escape. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And at the end of it, when you came out? When I came out, I thought I was going to be rewarded in a way that I was not. So well, nothing I could say because I had enlisted. I had gone and done what they told me to do and thought I was going to be rewarded. When I say rewarded, I mean maybe get a hundred dollars when I got ten. Yeah. They, uh, they really didn't do much for veterans. They just they they had, it, had it set up in a way that you could take advantage of it if I had gone to school and taken a course that would have benefit me, benefited me now, from then through now, I would have taken advantage, but to do that, I would have had to do something that they wanted me to do. And I didn't do that, so that's why that for a dime coming in. So were you
are you talking about staying in the Navy? I could have came out. I could have stayed in. But if I had stayed in, say, you would have been my captain. I would have had to enlist in a program that would have benefited. I would have had to do what he wanted me to do as well as something that I wanted to do. And I don't know what that would have been. Might have been something I liked, might have been something I disliked, but... You didn't do that? I didn't do that. So you were 21 when you mustered out. And In San Francisco, where they, where'd you discharge? Florida. Uh, I had to go to Florida to get discharged. Came across the country on the train or? On the train. On a cold train, by me. <laughs> Long, hard trip. It was. 46. It was, but. Well, were you with a lot of other servicemen on the train? Yes, with a lot of servicemen, not servicemen that I had served with. With others? Yes. Must have taken two or three days, three days, I bet. Maybe four. Five. Five days. Where'd you come in? Wait, where'd the independence come to? San Francisco again? Could be Seattle, could be San Francisco, could be uh, We sail up the coast of Portland, Oregon. Portland? Wow. Oh, all the way into Portland. That's a long way back. <laughs> no wonder it took five days to get to Florida. Right. In Portland, Oregon. Well, and what did you get when yeah, they give you an honorary discharge, a little button, and what else did you get when you... I got an honorary discharge and some choices. When I said choices, I could have stayed in the Navy as captain, which was good at that time. Because I said it was segregated. About the best anybody could do at that time if you were black. Right, right. And so I had some choices to make, which I made some. And I can't say they were the best, can't say they were the worst, but I were able to have them. Honorary discharge. I was able to go to school to do some things. Had I wanted to, some I did do. I don't know whether it was the best or not the best. But Had you graduated from high school before you went in the Navy? No. When I went in the Navy, Well, I said a joke. Me and a friend of mine, we didn't want to stay down in the country. I was working for a man called Daltry. Mm -hmm. And to work at his house was just like uh, going to work every day doing what they wanted me to do, so I did that. And I can't say I made the best choice. I can't but say you did the best you could. That was down there in Troop County, or was that in Atlanta? Troop County. Did 
Did you marry? Three times. Three times. <laughs> All right. That sure did. When did you move to Atlanta? said 51, 1951. And I was living down below John Plummer there. That's where you first came to to work for the Wolves, or did you work somewhere else in Atlanta first? I, you know, that's when I first came to work for the Wolves. And that was when you first came to Atlanta? Yes. And after that, well, you you became friends with General Plummer while working at the Wolves. That's correct. General Bill Plummer. Right. I was working at number seven. John Plummer lived at number 15, but they were next door to each other. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, John Plummer just seemed to like me, and I liked him. And so we got along together. And when the wolf moved to Florida, Jupiter Inlet, I went down there and it seemed like I was the only one there. It might have been somebody up there. <laughs> it didn't seem like it to be. So when I came back, John Plummer and uh, Mrs. Howell, you know, they were. So John Plummer told me that that would be the way for me to go. So I was taking it as good. And here he is today. That's Tail and Hardy. Wonderful. I haven't figured out how old. But <laughs> how old would you 78, did we say? Something like that. How old am I? 79. 79. Scoundrel. All right. Uh, would you say. John, would you say on the whole that your Navy experience was a good experience? Yes. Best for me because I did not have a high school education and I had to go to school in the Navy at that time. To make choices that I made might not have been the best choices. Mm -hmm. So you went to school aboard the ship? Yes. You did. I didn't realize that. You took some classes when you were on the ship. Until you uh, became a certain age. At that time, mm -hmm. you had to go to school you had a high school education. I see. So even in wartime? Yes, back then. On the ship, you went to school? Yes. And do you felt you really learned something in that school, or was it just something you had to do? I learned something, yes, but it was a field that I was already familiar with. See, uh, the family that I was working for when I went in and came out of the Navy in Dogville. Right. So it was. You didn't use it, maybe, is what you're saying, after the war? No, I didn't. I didn't continue to work for that family. I continued to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. But not for the same people. Not for the same people. Mm -hmm. So, Newell, you will remember, John had the green thumb in the family. I mean, how did you, I'm sure nothing you did in the Navy made you so very good with 
with raising and growing things. How, how did that skill come about? To garden. That's what I did in the country. And that's what I was going to have to continually to do in the country. See, we out six miles from a range where I was living and grew. That's what we did. And you must have done it a lot better than most people. So you learned that growing up yes. in the country. Yes. How many of them were in your family? How many? Mm -hmm. yeah. Brothers and sisters. Six. Three boys, three girls, and we all worked in the country. That was our way of life. My daddy, he was not educated. He was too to something. So you either. Somebody else's land. I was on the dog drill. On the dog drill. On the land farm. And did any of your other brothers or sisters do anything in the war? Or were you the only one who went off and joined up? I was the only one. sister, like I said, my father was not highly educated, so, but he could make stuff grow here. <laughs> and we either had to do that. That's what no choice. Not any choice. Yeah. So the Navy seemed like not a bad idea, not a bad choice at all. Not a bad choice at all. After I look back on it, because it was other choices I could have made, but I, I can't say how they would have turned out. Got you off the farm anyway. Yes, it did. Yes, it did. Saw a part of the world that not many people ever saw. That's true. That's true. Or the when Pacific. The, when the war ended. The ship I was on, USS Independent, was out between a little place called Yokohama and Yokosuka, Japan. Yeah. So, I could have stayed aboard the ship. I don't know what would have happened. I got off and yeah. And Henry, what did you say happened to the Independent? Independence probably was given to, well, she may have been so badly damaged they just scrapped her right away. Okay. Otherwise, they would have given her to England or France, and they would have scrapped her. Okay. okay. They, the Independence was the first ship of a class that were basically converted from cruisers mm -hmm. when they determined sure. that they needed aircraft carriers and they really didn't need any more cruisers. Mm -hmm. So they, they said, okay, all these cruisers we have, planned or actually have the hulls built, we're not going to finish them as cruisers. Mm -hmm. And so they became known as light aircraft carriers. And they played a huge role because they enabled the bigger carriers to stay out in the, the battlefield while these guys would, as John said, bring aircraft back and forth. But they also had a very active fighting role, as John said, 101 days under fire. And they fueled you up. Well, out in the ocean. Uh, yes, yes, we fueled out in the ocean. We didn't come in for anything. Mm -hmm. Except when they had to get repaired. What about?
but on the whole, you would say it was a good experience. Sounds like it. Yeah. Well, you survived. <laughs> I survived. <laughs> I survived. I was just going over my notes and thinking, the first captain you said was Captain Yorn or something like captain that? Captain Yorn. You? You are you. Okay. Anyway, you. that's an interesting that's a, It's an unusual name. Unusual I'm not sure how you spell it, but we can look that up. All right, good. So. Finish. We are so grateful to you. We thank you so much for coming to be interviewed and to talk and to put your record down for history, and it's important to have this. Thank so you. So that people yes. will know about it. Always. An experience that I'm sure I wouldn't have gotten any other way. I wouldn't have gotten any other way because to stand or sit here and to see a ship in that other room get blown up or blown down. <laughs> went through a lot, and you were very young, so survived with grace, and your country thanks you, and we thank you for coming to be interviewed. Well, thank you. Thank you. I'm happy it's all behind. I guess I ought to add a little P.S., and that is that John Broom worked with Henry Howell's mother in this beautiful garden of hers for many years. And that's how we know what a fine gardener you are. Miss Howell's mother have did more for me than any one person in the world. She wouldn't have been able to stay in that house without you. But you did more for her than any one person in the world. Well, you worked well together. We did. So the next interview, John, we get you to talk about my mother and father. Because of all the people alive, you knew them better. Then we'll get you back home, feed you something else, and uh, see if we can do that. Anytime. Anytime. That's a deal. Thank you. Your mother did more for me than any person I knew. Yeah. Thank you. So have we got anything we need to sign? You do. I, I signed mine. Or okay, anything else? good. No, that's all. Thank you. Uh-huh, we've just finished. Yes. Very good.